Hello everyone. There are many wonderful stories in the Bible. Some are factual stories and some are fiction stories like the parables. They all convey a moral or spiritual lesson and some insight. The story of the Samaritan woman in today's gospel is one of the most fascinating stories in the scriptures and it reveals many truths and has a powerful lesson for us. According to the story, one midday under the hot sun, Jesus was sitting by a well outside a Samaritan village breaking a journey between Judea and Galilee while his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. When a woman showed up to draw water from the well, Jesus asked her for some water. Jesus' simple request for water led to a long conversation with the woman. Now, the woman was a Samaritan. In Jesus' time, the Samaritans were considered of a mixed race and half-Jews, and were looked upon, religiously speaking, as unclean by the Jews. Many other conflicts existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, and the hatred between them was intense and long-standing. So the woman was not only surprised when Jesus spoke to her, but in fact she appeared to be a little on the defensive and was even suspicious. She perhaps in an angry tone asked him, How can you, a Jew, ask me a Samaritan woman for a drink? Of course, at that moment, she had no idea who Jesus really was, aside from the fact that he was a Jew. Despite her indifference, Jesus turned to something far more important and offered her living water. Friends, what is living water? From John's Gospel, we learn that living water refers to eternal life or participating in God's life which can be obtained through faith in Jesus Christ. Besides this, living water may also be a symbol of God's gifts of unconditional love, supernatural grace, salvation and the Holy Spirit with its seven gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety and fear of the Lord. So Jesus offered her the gift of living water that would quench and satisfy her inner thirst. But she took his offer of the living water literally and began stirring the conversation in another direction. Jesus' offer of giving her the living water provoked her to challenge him as to how he could draw water from a deep well without a bucket and whether he was greater than her forefather Jacob who had given the well as a gift to his son Joseph. In other words, the woman questioned Jesus' ability to provide such living water. Friends, knowing that she lacked the intelligence to understand his words, Jesus told the woman that anyone who would drink of this living water would never thirst again. Soon she began to show some interest even though she did not fully grasp the spiritual dimensions of Jesus' offer. She changed her tone and perhaps with a bit of excitement addressed the friendly stranger, Sir, and asked him to give her the living water, thinking that Jesus would quench her physical thirst and she would have no need to come back to the well. But Jesus, before giving her the water, told her, to call her husband and then come back. Friends, why do you think Jesus asked her to call her husband? Jesus wanted to confront her about her personal sins. He consciously raised the issue of her relationship with men to challenge her to look into herself, her personal and private life, and to remove all obstacles preventing her from receiving the living water he had to offer. Friends, she was certainly startled by this request from Jesus. She immediately thought about the wrong things that she had done. However, instead of admitting her sinfulness, she tried to cover up her guilt by denying that she had a husband. 
she had already had five husbands and was living with the sixth one. That is to say, she was an unmarried woman openly living with the sixth man and was marked as immoral and looked down upon by her own people. This is evidenced by the fact that she came alone to draw water from the community well when, during biblical times, drawing water and chatting at the well was the social high point of a woman's day. Friends, even though she did recognize Jesus as a prophet who knew many things about her, she further tried to dodge the whole issue of her private life by engaging in a religious debate with Jesus about the real worship of God. By this, she revealed her spiritual ignorance. The woman was talking about the worship of her forefathers. What was it? Since the Samaritans were a mixed race of people, half Jewish and half Gentile, they had been excluded from the temple of Jerusalem even before the time of Jesus. Angered by this, they went to Samaria where they built a rival temple on Mount Harazim. In this temple, they placed a copy of the Bible but only the Torah or Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, which they had brought from Jerusalem. In time, they became a new people called the Samaritans. They rejected all other Old Testament books, including the writings of the prophets, and regarded their temple as the center of legitimate worship as opposed to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and this caused constant hostilities between the Samaritans and the Jews. But Jesus directed her to the worship of God the Father. Jesus told her that worshipping God does not merely mean performing rituals and devotions, reading books and being in places, but also to have a very personal relationship with God. He reminded her that the time was near for true worshippers to worship God the Father in spirit and truth, and referred to himself as the new temple that would replace the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Finally, her eyes were opened to the faith when Jesus admitted that the one who is speaking to her is the promised Messiah. In her excitement, she forgot all about her physical thirst and left her water pot at the well and ran back to the village and told others about her experience. They then invited Jesus to stay with them and many more people began to believe in him. And they told the woman that they believed in Jesus not because of what she had said about him but because they had heard for themselves his teaching. Friends, what is the message for us? First, the story teaches us that God loves us in spite of our sinfulness. He values us enough to actively seek us, to welcome us to intimacy and to rejoice in our worship. Even if no one cares for us, and neither do we, God sees us as very precious and valuable to Him. He sees our sin but is ready to forgive us because Jesus fully took our sin on Himself and paid for our sin with his death on the cross. Secondly, the story teaches that every so often, like the Samaritan woman, we too are preoccupied with worldly affairs, material and temporal goods. Sometimes, in our worship of God, we give more importance to norms, ritual, traditions and visible and tangible objects rather than be concerned with the internal disposition of the person and our personal relationship with God. We try mostly to quench our physical thirst. We fill our everyday life with superficial conversation and routines. We seldom stop and examine our personal life or give a serious thought to our private life, for we are afraid to look at ourselves. We are also often prejudiced to God's commandments and His Church's teachings. We dodge issues affecting us, our families and relationships by engaging in debates and arguments. 
we alienate ourselves more and more from God and others due to our sins. We fill our empty jar again and again with the same deceitful riches. Thirdly, this story reminds us of the spiritual thirst of human life. Friends, even though on the surface we are thirsty for material things, deep down we are thirsty for the meaning and purpose of life. Ultimately, our thirst is a thirst for God Himself. Jesus says that He alone can satisfy that thirst with the living water. But to receive the living water that Jesus offers, we must believe in the supernatural gift, the gift of the living water. We must establish a real intimate personal relationship with Him. We must courageously admit how thirsty we are for His love, mercy, forgiveness, grace, salvation and divine life. Friends, we must sincerely and confidently converse with Him during our worship. We must renounce any preoccupation with the worldly concerns, over attachment to material things and all our sinful ways. We must prevent ritualistic ceremonies, doctrines and teachings of the church, rules and regulations of a community from getting in the way of our worshipping God genuinely or building an intimate relationship with Him. Finally, we must humbly ask Jesus to give us the living water so that we may never thirst again. Fourthly, the story motivates us to tell others of our faith experience so they also may believe in Jesus Christ and His power, not because others have told us about Him, but because we have heard and experienced Him ourselves. Amen. God bless you.